I'd like to say good morning to everyone. My name is Pam Benuti, and I'll be your moderator this morning. Um, and welcome to the Ithaca Branch class. And I will be your moderator for this class. This school is not a church, neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh or Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. The school was established as a result of the divine vision and revelation given to Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. This Ithaca branch was established in 1979. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to um, the Dean of our Ithaca branch, Dr. Robert White, and our host, Dr. Gregory Prestes. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Heavenly Father the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Joshua and it has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that every Lord must have a name and every God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, excuse me, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that's made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language some 1400 years after, until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true name and original name of our father and his son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit. And in this pure spirit state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because the cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all the way around the edges of the chart to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within this pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, the self same speaker. <clears throat> Of the earth plane as Joshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. 
So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of his name and title may be had by reading the preface of a Holy Name Bible. Also in the school we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him this tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place in a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In the school, we show proof how that everything is made, everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern. And absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now in the school, we have 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives, and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, both modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation in faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new world state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is to speak the truth. And at this time, we'll have the prayer to dedicate today's lecture by Dr. Judith Turner. That will be followed by our scripture, which is Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter. Let us all bow our hearts and minds unto Yahshua. And Yahshua, um, I want you to hear I pray that you hear this prayer within each and every one of us because we are here to praise you. That's why we're here. In Yahshua's precious name, let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pam, who did you want to read the scripture? Go ahead, Peggy. Okay. Deuteronomy 17. Thou shalt not sacrifice unto Yahweh the Elohim any bullock or sheep wherein is blemish or any evil favoredness, for that is an abomination unto Yahweh the Elohim. If there be found among you within any of the gates which Yahweh the Elohim giveth thee, man or woman, that has wrought wickedness in the sight of Yahweh the Elohim, in transgressing his covenant and has gone and served other gods and worshiped them 
either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded, and it be told thee, and thou hast heard it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing certain that such an abomination is wrought in Israel, then shall thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shall stone them with stones till they die. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death and afterward the hands of all the people. So thou shalt put the evil away from among you. If there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, and between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within thy gates, then shalt thou arise and get thee up into the place which Yahweh the Elohim shall choose. And thou shalt come unto the priests of the Levites and unto the judge that shall be in those days and inquire, and they shall slew thee with a sentence of judgment. And thou shalt do according to the sentence which they of that place which Yahweh shall choose shall show thee. And thou shalt observe to do according to all that they inform thee, according to the sentence of the law, which they shall teach thee, and according to the judgment, which they shall tell thee, thou shalt do. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence, which they shall show thee to the right hand or nor to the left. And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there before Yahweh the Elohim, or unto the judge, even that man shall die, and thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. And all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. When thou art come unto the land which Yahweh the Elohim giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom Yahweh the Elohim shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, or cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as Yahweh has said unto you, you shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart torn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply himself silver and gold. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priests of the, of, before the, priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Yahweh his Elohim, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. That's Deuteronomy 17th chapter. Thank you, Dr. Turner, and thank you, Dr. Trevison. Um, we're going to have a little different format this morning. Um, we, we talked about it last week since the scripture was going to be Deuteronomy 17, um, just to remind us of, of the kings and, and, you know, any information that you have to share um, and if you do have information to share, you can put a chat in and actually you can do it to everyone. It doesn't have to be to just me, but to everyone. And then I will, I can call your name. Um, for the first um, speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Susie Zukowski. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. Um, in thinking about 
what we were um, going to, to, to do today with the testimonies or our reflections on the kingship study that we've just gone through. Um, there were a few things that I just wanted to mention. Um, it is not necessarily going to feel like everything's connected, but certain observations or things that were thought provoking to me as we worked through this, I just wanted to share. Um, the scripture reading actually Deuteronomy 17 is interesting because it actually foreshadowed everything that was going to happen um, relative to a lot of the uh, events that we looked at with the different kings and it made me think about when I was reading it ahead of class about how the priests and the judges and the kings uh, there was a standard that Yahweh set up and wanted to have those with a perfect heart and a heart that loved him and was going to follow his commandments. But as we saw all the way through, um, for a while, some of that happened, but for um, all of those earthly representatives that came in the name of Yahweh, eventually things happened and there was none truly righteous and none that was able to be um, the one that represented Yahweh with a fully perfect heart and life. Um, and the spirit came and went as Yahweh uh, decided to do things with those, those men. So it, it manifests in the big picture Yahweh's purpose and plan and showed that he essentially orchestrated, he declared the end from the beginning with everybody that we studied and that it was his purpose and plan. And even though Israel thought, for example, that they wanted to have a king like all those people around them, Yahweh actually was the one that picked the king and had the king anointed um, when it first started out with Saul and then played through with David and Solomon for, for the um, ones that we did study. And it was his purpose and plan that unfolded and things happened according to his um, choices, his uh, depiction of, of the events. So it was very clear to me when you took what we would call a bird's eye view of things that Yahweh was fully working his purpose through all of this. Whereas if you just read different chapters or different incidences that occurred with the various people, you might think that it was just men making decisions and choosing to do certain things and things that events that happened, but it truly manifested the purpose of Yahweh as we work down through these things. Um, could we get... Um, First Kings, the eighth chapter, and I want to get down towards the end of that chapter where um, Solomon had offered up a prayer, and I'm going to go over there with you here, when they had moved the ark into the temple and were having the celebrations, uh, it describes down towards the end of the chapter, let's see. Why don't we start at 54, 1 Kings 8, 54, and read. And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying, all this prayer and supplication unto Yahweh, he arose from before the altar of Yahweh, from kneeling on his knees, with his hands spread up to heaven. And he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be Yahweh that hath given rest unto his people Israel. According to all that he promised, there hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. All right, so Solomon is testifying through this prayer that he's saying in a loud voice. So he's saying it for all the people to hear that Yahweh keeps his promises. Yahweh has not failed one word of the promises that he made by the hand of Moses, his servant. Read. 
Yahweh our Elohim be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. And let these my words wherewith I have made supplication before Yahweh be nigh unto Yahweh our Elohim day and night, that he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel at all times as the matter shall require. That all the people of the earth may know that Yahweh is Elohim and that there is none else. All right. And so he's keeping the people um, focused on Yahweh is their Elohim and there is none else. And he's asking Yahweh to keep all of these things that he, the house has been, the temple has been built for the name of Yahweh and the celebration of Yahweh and the worship of Yahweh and wants the people to continually remember that Yahweh is Elohim and that there is none else. That is not a bad prayer for us to keep in mind as well. Keep reading. Let your heart therefore be perfect with Yahweh our Elohim, to walk in his statutes, to keep his commandments as at this day. And the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before Yahweh. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered unto Yahweh, two and twenty thousand oxen and a hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of Yahweh. The same day did the king hallow the middle of the court that was before the house of Yahweh. For there he offered burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar that was before Yahweh was too little to receive the burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings. And at that time Solomon held a feast, and all Israel with them, a great congregation. For the entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt before Yahweh our Elohim, seven days and seven days, even fourteen days. On the eighth day he sent the people away, and they blessed the king, and went under their tents joyful and glad of heart, for all the goodness that Yahweh had done for David his servant and for Israel, his people. And so after we got done reading this section of this chapter about essentially the dedication or when the temple was really fully ready to um, fulfill the, the worship of Yahweh, it made me think of uh, what happens when you have somebody who buys a new house and a uh, housewarming party is thrown for them. This was like the housewarming party of all parties when you read about the number of sacrifices and the number of people that were there worshiping and essentially all the celebration that they had and how the uh, dedication of this temple um, is an example of, um, I prepare a place for you. Now we know Yahweh had given instructions back with, for the tabernacle to be dwelt so that he could dwell among them. This was another structure that had divine specifications for how it was going to be built and that it was intended to be the place for Yahweh to dwell. And so um, I thought how excellent would that have been to, to be there from a natural standpoint, just as a natural example of a great housewarming party that they had for the temple of Yahweh after it was built and many years went by before it got totally finished and was able to be um, inhabited by Yahweh and dedicated to, to the worship of Yahweh. But we know it was temporary. It was a, everything back under that old covenant was a natural example, was a type and a shadow and it was a glorious structure, but it still was a temporary structure and was a, pointing us to what was going to be under the new covenant, the dwelling place of Yahweh. So 
the other thing that this all made me think about was, um, and actually Carl talked about some of this in his lecture last evening in the Oceanside class. Could we go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and would the other scripture reader get 1 Corinthians 6? And I'd just like to finish up by um, pulling a couple of scriptures to, to talk about what this temple was intended to be a type and a shadow of. Um, in Ephesians 4, let's start at 12, please. Ephesians 4 and 12. For the perfecting of the sons, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Yahshua, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of Elohim unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Messiah. All right. So what precedes where we started reading, uh, talking about the various gifts and the various um, positions mm -hmm. or activities or responsibilities that, that we are given. And it differs from person to person. Not everybody is an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, um, but it's all in verse 12, all for the perfecting of the sons, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of the Messiah, till we come in the unity of the faith and unto a perfect man, the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Messiah. So a body is being built, um, coming unto a perfect man and all of those things that we have been given all make up the parts of the body. Um, Carl spent some time talking about different things in the human body that make up that body. And that if you don't have all of those things and they're not working properly, it's not considered to be a normal or a quote, perfect or complete body. And so it's the same thing um, if we go into 1 Corinthians 6, um, and let me tell you where I'd like to start here. Um, could we pick up verse 11, please? Um, bef and what we read about before 11, and I'm pulling scriptures selectively, not reading a lot of the, the background, but he's talking about what is in the world and what people are like idolaters, adulterers, um, fornicators, drunkards. He goes through this whole list. And then we pick up verse 11, please. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of Yahshua the Messiah and by the spirit of our Elohim. All right. And so, and such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of Yahshua and by the spirit of Elohim. So that body that was washed, sanctified, and justified is not our physical body. He's not talking about the body under the new covenant um, being the natural vessel that we're all walking around with or limping around with these days. He's talking about the inner man, the spiritual body. Read verse 15. Know you not that your bodies are the members of the Messiah? All right. Know you not that your bodies are the members of the Messiah. Again, we realize he's not talking about our physical bodies. He's talking about the inner man. And then jump down to 19 and 20, which we're used to reading and um, think about, hopefully think about in a spiritual way, in principle, not in manifestation. Read. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which you have of Yahweh and you are not your own. All right. And to many of the churches in the world, they think about that body talked about there as uh, providing them with direction to not smoke and to not drink and all, all these other things that they make rules about thinking that this body that's being talked about is the physical body, but it's not. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's the inner man which you have of Yahweh and you're not your own and you're bought with a price. Glorify Yahweh in your body and in your spirit, which are his. And then the one um, other thing I wanna pull in here is Revelation chapter 21 and um, just point something out that I had realized when I was um, researching back, looking at the temple during our study. Um, 
Let's see. Let's read the first couple of verses. Revelation 21, read one through three, please. Revelation 21 and one. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were paved away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from Elohim out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim himself shall be with them and be their Elohim. All right. And so John, in his vision, sees new heaven and new earth and sees the holy city, New Jerusalem, again, not a physical city, a mm -hmm. talking about a type and a shadow of the promised land or of heaven or eternal life. And he, he describes it as, behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men and he will dwell with them because these buildings are always typifying a place for Yahweh to dwell with us, among us. And as it picked up in John, the 14th chapter with the comforter, um, eventually the translation is to dwell within us. But when you get down to... Um, and then you go through a whole description of the city, of all the jewels and the gold and the, um, the roads and everything like that, the gates. You get down mm -hmm. to verse 22. And if you would read that, please. And I saw no temple therein, for Yahweh Elohim Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And read 23, please. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of Yahweh did lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof. All right, and so I found it fascinating that goes through this whole description of the city of New Jerusalem, and then makes a point that says, I saw no temple therein, for Yahweh, Elohim, and the lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, for the lamb is the light thereof. And so it puts it in a whole different, when you have a city, a holy city in the natural, you expect to find a temple a place to worship Yahweh and a place where Yahweh would say that he dwelled among his people. But in this case, the spiritual um, uh, dwelling place of a city, the promised land, there's no temple therein. There's no structure that we think of as a building because Yahshua is the temple thereof. And that's the, the spiritual body that we're all being built um, with lively stones being slipped into the temple, the spiritual house of Yahweh um, that's, that's being built. And um, Carl had worked on that principle in, in his lecture last night. So um, with that, I'd like to stop. I hope that um, that was clear what I was trying to express because the whole thing reiterated so strongly for me, the concept of the inner man and the spiritual temple and um, how Yahweh has worked his purpose by um, the end declared from the beginning with all of these things that we looked at. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zakowski. Um, and for our next speaker, I'd like to um, ask Dr. Donald O'Connell. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I got to go right back to the beginning of this whole series because, well, I guess I have time. It's my testimony. That's right. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm going to say, but I was uh, very happy that the Ithaca class decided to um, work with the kings. Um, I know my upbringing in this class, I never really got involved with a lot of uh, reading with the historical stuff that went on. Uh, I didn't mind listening to everybody else do it, but I never really um, was involved with it. I mean, there was a lot of bits and pieces a lot of explanations of things that I heard over the years, a lot of beautiful points. Um, 
But the idea that uh, Dr. White wanted to share with us was that there's a lot of things in here that we all would be able to benefit from. And he wanted us not to be, I think the word he used, uh, shy about getting in there and digging into this stuff. Mm -hmm. And boy, was that ever a true statement because when you're not familiar with history and you're not familiar with things, uh, I know it left me quite uh, in a state of, oh my God, uh, that's the kind of way I felt a lot of times, especially when you start reading about uh, the uh, with Solomon when he was building this temple. It was just such a magnificent structure. You just keep reading it now. Oh, big these cherubim of glory were and you know them floating down all this uh, stone carvings of wood from Lebanon and you're just you're just overwhelmed not overwhelmed in a bad way you're just overwhelmed at the magnificence of Yahweh that is allowing a structure that was a manifestation or a place for his name in the earth plane. It just left me in awe. And to go back to the very beginning, when we first, the first thing that um, Bob White did, he read, read a transcript of Dr. Kinley regarding the Kings and I believe resurrection. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had to read it a few times. I was just um, amazed because in his mind, well, everything's a, where he was and what he's seen is, you know, we, we always say that he, uh, he had a vision directly from Yahweh and the revelation. I mean, he, his, own, his own way of looking at things after that was everything's a correlation of everything else, of everything else. And he would go and throw things out in the discourse of that transcript and you just sit there and you go, well, I think he said it in there. He said, don't you wish you could do this? There's something comparable to that. And yeah, to be able to follow the, the correlations, to be able to follow the, uh, as was written in the Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter, to be able to look at witnesses so that every matter could be established. That is a phenomenal thing. It's a phenomenal gift that we've been given. We, we sometimes, after being here a while, we, we think that's normal. We, we we sometimes mm. think that everybody does that. No, they they don't. They they think whatever they think is right, and well, we know how that turns out for everybody. And again, going back to the transcript, it set the pace for realizing that these kings, both when we were dealing with Saul, we were dealing with David, we were dealing with. Um, Solomon, and all the different speakers we were able to bring out. And I, I can't get into everything that everybody said, but everybody provided witnesses out of the out of the book for things that they were talking about, and the witnesses actually establish a truth. A testimony is a truth-bearing thing especially if it's accompanied with witnesses. You don't want to be having your eternal life based on speculation, based on a good feeling. Although sometimes good feelings are real good when they're reasonably expressed because of their uh, reactions to the truth. I mean, sometimes I just get so overwhelmed. I'm in tears over things. And it's not tears of sadness, it's tears of, oh my God, this is really how Yahweh is. And that's what happened during a lot of these episodes with the, the different speakers and the points that they brought out they were just phenomenal. They were just a, a beautiful thing. And when I say beautiful, and I, I might have to reiterate some of the things Susie was talking about because uh, when, when I think about that temple and the prayer that David had, um, knowing that he wasn't going to be able to um, build that structure, but his son Solomon did. Both of these guys had some prayers that were, I don't know, they left me in tears that they had 
such a heart in them to petition Yahweh with everything that was in them. I mean, it went on for chapters. I might be exaggerating a little, but they were extremely heartfelt, mm -hmm. praying unto Yahweh. I mean, especially, I'm especially mindful of what he said, who are we or what is this people that you're even mindful of us since you made all things? Mm -hmm. It's a humbling, very humbling experience to be uh, sitting in the midst of your brethren, in the midst of Yahweh, in the midst of that temple, and recognizing that, and recognizing whose presence you're really in. And when they dedicated that temple, I mean, again, all I kept seeing was this grandeur, this grandiose thing that was a, a physical expression, what it is that the temple of the Holy Spirit is. We have no idea, we don't realize the uh, uh, entire nature of Yahweh that we're going to continue to learn of. But if we could just look at these physical types and just keep coming back to class, I'm so glad I kept I kept coming for these uh, this this discourse on the, all these things, and I know I was hesitant a few times and don't know really what to say, and and sometimes Yahweh gives you something to say, and uh, it, it, it's just a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to be able to have a witness. It's a beautiful thing to be able to. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I, that's the first time that Ricky got into some history last week with the uh, Jeremiah 31 with Jeroboam and Rehoboam and made Jeremiah 31 make a lot more sense to me. And even though I've heard it before, I was like, oh my God, all this time I've been sitting here and I finally got something answered that uh, got answered. I mean, how many times do you have to have these gems spoken of before you sit back and realize mm -hmm. somebody just polished them for you and placed them in your temple for you? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful thing. I mean, we know that those stones in the temple were floated down and fit into place. And we used this example over the years that that was a type of how he just places things in us and nobody... Nobody's got a clue sitting right next to you that some beautiful gem just went in and hit the spot mm -hmm. so that you can continue to give the glory unto Yahweh throughout your days in this creation. And I know I have more things to say, but I think I'm running out of gas here. But I want to thank the Ithaca class for holding this uh, series. Um, uh, like I say, this is just an example. All this stuff at the temple, the gloriousness of this tabernacle. We have no clue sometimes about how glorified. We say this all the time in our prayers. Our prayers are dedicated to that which we know to be true. And it's that precious body of Yahshua that's dwelling in our hearts and our minds. It ought to give every one of us a reckon, not a reckoning, a realization of just where we are in the purpose. It's the angels that keep singing praise unto him, praise unto him. We sometimes don't realize that's exactly what we've been doing. As soon as he's entered into your heart and mind, you have nothing else to be able to do but give praise unto his name. When you're in class, when you're out of class. Thank you for the time. That's all I'd like to turn it back to the moderator. Thank you, Dr. O'Connell. Um, at this time, I'd like to open up the floor because there's someone else that would like to say something. Don't go quiet on me. Pregnant pause. Mm -hmm. So let me just um, say something short, uh, and that is 
that as far as this series on the Kings, uh, it's been very enlightening personally, because for the most part, um, when we think of the Kings, uh, Saul and David and Solomon, we think of only the highlight that uh, the world also um, promotes. And so, for instance, with Saul, and particularly Saul, struck me uh, hard about this in that um, Saul's legacy in the world, if you will, and the carnal minded men who try to understand this Bible uh, circles around that he had an evil spirit in him and fought against David and quote went crazy on and off like a um, you know like you would expect someone who was schizophrenic almost and uh, and you just wait for Saul to die and David to take over because of this uh, evil nature that uh, seems to be expressed with Saul. And of course, David's highlight for the most part is his relationship with Beersheba and the re the receiving of the instructions for the the temple uh, aren't really um, recognized for what Yahweh has done with David as it's described uh, he made me to understand um, the workings of this temple by running his hand over his body I, I'm paraphrasing of course and um, so uh, they've missed this whole point that Susie brought up in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, how this whole thing that is played out with these kings is for our instruction about the spiritual um spiritual aspect of Yahweh's eternal purpose. And then Solomon, uh, we just think of the wisdom of Solomon. And um, as far as his ending with uh, his heart apparently being turned towards the gods of his many wives, um, you know, we judge him in such a way. But this aspect of Sol Solomon and the end point of his uh, life and what it made manifest uh, is an instruction for us about the difference between the natural manifestation and the spiritual principle, because the natural manifestation doesn't hold up in the flesh, which was seen by Israel going into Canaan's land and if, after having the experiences and history of Egypt and the wilderness and Joshua, the son of Nun, fighting their battles and all of this, that they were so, still easily removed from worshiping Yahweh uh, as they were instructed, even to the attempt of it from a physical manifestation. They even lost the insight to the to attempt to be sincere in, in worshiping Yahweh um, because of the environment of Canaan's land, which was left with those tribes that could turn around and deceive them. And so all of these things are instructive to us uh, in this time where we speak. Uh, and these things point to our relationship with our creator, which is an invisible relationship. And I've not uh, been able to away from the idea that um, Yahweh is invisible and Yahweh Elohim is invisible and Yahshua is invisible. And they can only be seen by the things that are made in the natural 
uh, reports that we've been reading about in the Kings, these things uh, need to be understood from an invisible spiritual standpoint. Uh, the mystery of iniquity is not this devil that Hollywood uh, produces, but the mystery of iniquity is a spirit and it is invisible, uh, but it has an action on the soul of man which is invisible. And um, we have go all the way over to, to know that no man has seen Yahweh at any time. The only begotten son who's in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. And in, in Israel, the elders saw uh, Yahweh Elohim, hands, feet, and a body, but that really was just a vision. What cast that vision is still invisible. And so we are left with needing to see these examples in order to understand spiritual principles. And I'll just finish with this. And that takes me back to my appreciation of Saul. Of course, David and Solomon as well. I learned a lot of things that I didn't know about uh, significant occurrences in their reigns, etc. But Saul particularly struck me when uh, we read all the way to the onset of um, uh, Samuel uh, interacting with Saul's father to check out all his sons and Saul was left out. He was too young. He was, as it said, among the stuff uh, which uh, correlates to, and if you think of a boy and I uh, thought of myself, what stuff was he among and you know, and so I could only imagine that he was in and amongst all of the implements of war, the swords and the, 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 the armor and all of those things, this, the, the storehouses. So if you have an army and you have to, to suit up the army that they did back then, uh, you had to have a storehouse or a place where you kept all that stuff. And, um, and of course, that's going to foreshadow the whole David and Goliath thing, because that armor and that stuff for our understanding in the spirit is not going to be sufficient in order to overcome a mystery of iniquity as powerful and tall and, uh, as uh, uh, Goliath was in comparison to all the other men. And that's uh, mystery of iniquity in, in his uh, essence of strength. And so uh, Saul was chosen uh, uh, to be the warrior in a sense, or to lead the fights that he did. And uh, I could see Saul being the court roundabout of these kings, David being the holy place where the heart is in the holy place of your body. And these are all broken up little manifestations, but yet and still uh, direct us to recognizing the order of these kings being court roundabout, holy place and most holy place. And yet all of them have their failings when compared to the court roundabout, holy place and most holy place of Yahweh, uh, the true uh, thing we're trying to learn about. And so, uh, Saul initially has a good heart and a good spirit is placed within him. He had, as we read, he had a new heart, if I can say it like that. And then when it came time for David to come into his uh, inheritance as king, even in the pre-anointing uh, of him, um, that spirit left Saul at the same time that Samuel was um, identifying David. And then once that spirit left Saul, then there was no other option but a mystery of iniquity to enter that house. And then we saw that, the results of that. Uh, and I won't go on with these details, but Saul takes on a different light to me, this court roundabout um, aspect of Yahweh's purpose, wherein uh, we deal with the mystery of iniquity uh, because we do have uh, not only the scripture we've read talk about peace offerings, etc., on these altars, 
uh, but there was also sin offerings. And, but you don't have uh, that same principle in the holy place, in the most holy place. Once you get past that door uh, after the death, burial, and resurrection, and so that overcomes uh, that mystery of iniquity. So I just see that Saul is just not this evil guy, but is playing uh, a part in Yahweh's purpose to show us uh, uh, where we find ourselves prior to coming into class. There, We were dead on arrival and we were influenced by the mystery of iniquity and, and we had not yet seen any uh, righteous spiritual principles about our creator. We needed to come in contact with uh, Yahweh Elohim himself, Yahshua, who preaches this gospel. And uh, in turn, it is Yahshua in each and every one of us who have received this gospel that is preaching this gospel. And that's the direction, again, the invisible spirit of Yahweh that all of these manifestations are giving us instruction about and placing us at certain parts of that tabernacle in our understanding uh, based on the principles that we see, we can understand where we stand in Yahweh. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Emler. Um, can I ask if there's anyone else that would like to speak? This is Sue. Can I add one thing after hearing what Carl had to say? Sure. Yeah. Um, Carl made me think when he was talking about Goliath um, that the mystery of iniquity always puts out something that appears to be a very great challenge. Um, thinking back to the children of Israel when they sent the spies out to spy out the land and they saw giants in the land, which the people did not believe, obviously, that Yahweh would fight for them and that he could deliver the promised land. But the principle there is that those challenges or the unbelief always has us looking at giant challenges or um, huge uh, th things that we don't think we can overcome and forget that Yahweh's going to take care of things for us. But thinking about what Wally was describing, that temple was magnificent. It was huge in glory in the workmanship and uh, what Yahweh put forth as well for the people to recognize the grandeur of his dwelling place. And so it just made me think about how the mystery of iniquity works with our, our minds to put out something that we think we can't overcome and that is too big to take on um, and forget that Yahweh is the one fighting the battles for us. Thank you. Thank you. For our next speaker, I'd like to present Dr. Judith Turner. I'm desperately trying to find in my broken Bible, for we have such a king and high priest. And my Bible literally is in pieces. <laughs> it's in Hebrews. Hebrews 8. I thought it was in Hebrews. I think it's Hebrews 8. Okay. Can I get, I, let me just try to get there. If I can't find it, I'm going to let you start at one. One Hebrews eight and one. Okay. There's one. Yeah, I don't have I don't have eight. At least I don't see it where it's supposed to be. Go ahead. Oh, dear. <laughs> Hebrews eight. I want to read it for you. It doesn't matter. It just needs to be read. Now the things which we have spoken, this is to some. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Okay. Um, can we go back to seven? And I'm sorry, I'm not even looking at it. I'm just listening. 
you know, but we need, we need to know of the things that have been spoken, mm -hmm. that this in eighth chapter is the sum. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 7, 1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high Elohim, mm -hmm. who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Right, and all of this with Abraham is all before the judges. Mm -hmm. It's right. all before the judges fell out of favor and then we got the kings keep going verse three without father without mother without a descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life but made like unto the son of Yahweh, abideth a priest continually uh -huh. now oh, consider, okay keep going okay now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are, are the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is... Okay, and this Melchizedek, and I'm sorry, I'm just, I finally found it in my Bible. Mm -hmm. He's a king, and he's a king of what country? What territory? What? But Salem of peace yeah. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this is a king before the kings keep going uh in verse five i think and verily they that are the sons of levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of their brethren though they come out of the loins of abraham but he whose descent is not counted from among them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And, and who's the one that was not accounted among them, but Melchizedek? Right. And you guys can correct me. Some of you are far more versed in this purpose and pattern and plan than I am, but keep going. It's Melchizedek from my mm -hmm. understanding. Verse seven. He didn't have any lineage at all mm -hmm. from right. the 12 tribes. Keep going. Verse seven, and without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here, men that die receive tithes, but there he received them of whom it is written that he liveth. And Keep as on. I may so say, Levi also who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Right, if Abraham, Levi is a son of Abraham. Mm -hmm. This is a, actually a very good chapter as well. Keep going. 11. For if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Okay. And this Melchizedek, did he have any beginning of days? No. Did he have any end of days? No. Mm -mm. So did he really rise afterward? Or was he always a part of mm -hmm. Yahweh's purpose and plan? Mm -hmm. This is interesting to me. Keep going. Verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance to the altar. No man gives attendance to the altar. And did we have the tribe of Yahshua? Mm -hmm. Did we have a tribe of Melchizedek? Mm -hmm. I'm just causing, asking you guys these questions mm -hmm. just so you can think, that's all. Keep going. 14, for it is evident that our master sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yep. yet far more evident. Keep going. For that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Okay, and that is really interesting, the power of an endless life. That's what we are being introduced here through Yahshua 
our savior. This is the power of endless life. And we're, when we're dealing with the judges and the people get tired of the judges, and then they have these poor kings of which Saul, he was freaked out about being king. But when you're a king, you've got to make decisions. And when you make a decision, sometimes it's not the right one and people don't like you. But this is before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with Saul. I'm going on what Carl talked about. Keep going. 17, for he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before of the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Uh -huh. for the, Keep going. Sorry. For the made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto Yahweh. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. Okay. For so I just want us all, I want me to understand that, you know, when we read about our forefathers, they were not perfect. And they did the best with what they had. I mm -hmm. mean, you have to remember that David was, at one point, Saul's armor bearer. At another point, he soothed Saul when Saul was horribly distressed. Mm -hmm. And David would come in and play for him. And David made mistakes. Yeah. This was all leading up to where we are at right now. And I'm not going to be up long because I know I'm, I'm being a little bit more emotional than I would like to be. Keep going. Uh, 21, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, Yahshua swear and will not repent. Thou well, art he won't change this. He's not going to change this. You and I are going to be, pre uh, be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, mm -hmm. Melchizedek who was way back before the law was even put into operation, the old covenant law. Keep going. 22, by so much was Yahshua made a surety of a better testament. Right. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Uh -huh. but this man, because he continueth forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Okay, Therefore, and this, go keep going. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto Yahweh by him, seeing that he liveth to make intercession for them. For such he lives to make intercession. Mm -hmm. And um, David was given the instruction to make intercession to Saul that, so he could have some sort of peace while he was operating in this creation and chosen to be king. Did he want to be king? Did he, did he, um, did he plan for it? Did he run a political party? Did he do any of that stuff? No, he just got chosen. And it's because we're all a part of Yahweh's purpose and plan. I hope I'm making some sort of sense. All right, keep going. 26, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those, as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did And want. I do think we're still talking about Melchizedek here. He didn't have to offer up sacrifices. Did David have to offer up sacrifices? Did Saul, did all those judges back there some of them you know th their sacrifices weren't accepted samuel's was but that's it go ahead uh to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once when he offered up himself for the all law right, okay you're not talking about yashua keep going for the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. 
forevermore. And, you know, Melchizedek is just a sign that that spirit law was even before that physical law took shape and form. And when we read about the happenings down through history, they are trying to do their best, just like we are trying to do our best. Okay. And they serve onto what? Eight and five. Hebrews 8 and 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of Yahweh when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that they'll make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Okay, so they're following the pattern that was shown to them in the mount, but they did not understand what the outcome was going to be. And I just know that from following patterns in my youth. I mean, I see the picture of the pattern, but mm -hmm. when I start cutting out all the parts, I just have to follow the directions because I don't understand that I'm actually going to get the outcome that is on that cover of that pattern. Mm -hmm. And you have to follow. And some of you, and, 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 Peg, I know you understand. You have to follow the pattern. Got to stick with it. That's right. And that is exactly what these gentlemen, these our forefathers, our beloved in the spirit, were trying desperately to do before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Can I put it that way? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now go to the um, where I talked about that I wanted. Um, such are kings one. and high priests. Oh, it was one? Oh, my gosh. Keep going. Go back to one. Eight and now, one. Hebrews eight and one. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have Now, such this is the sum. And the, the, mm -hmm. the seventh verse of Hebrews was talking about a ministry after the order of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. And he talked all about it. And now this is the res end result. This is the patterns then constructed. And this is what we are now going to be able to wear because it's all done. Go ahead. This is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle, which Yahweh pitched, and not man. Okay, and then they go back to all the high priests before that. Mm -hmm. All the kings can be added mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. But Yahshua, it was all, and we all know this. This is not something new. But understanding the humanity of some of the vessels that were chosen down through the law and the prophets, we ought to be able to be a little bit more merciful to them, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed this myself, and um, I hope I wasn't too miscombobulated. I'll give up the floor. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Would anyone else? like to get up i just want to make one quick point here in hebrews the eighth chapter where judith had read he just in one now the things which we have spoken this is the sum and then it says this we have talking about those after pentecost with the holy mm -hmm. spirit we have such a high priest and where is this high priest that you have in you? He is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's where he is. And that's where he is in you. And that that has been revealed in you is in that place. And uh, it's just these aspects of the preciousness 
of the Holy Spirit that brings us to an understanding of Yahweh and his uh, purpose uh, because there's no way to see it unless you have these things. Mm -hmm. And then when you see the manifestations, then you have to accept where you stand in Yahweh's purpose with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not disjointed. And we many members make up the one body and he is the head and he is currently set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So I just wanted to emphasize that point. Anybody else want to add anything? Uh, if I may. Hello? Hello? It's Sasha. Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you, Sasha. Right. Okay, great. So, yeah, I would like to uh, give a short uh, testimony because what uh, uh, Judith ended with, she ended with uh, uh, Yasha having uh, mercy to uh, on all of us. And uh, I would like you to read uh, Isaiah chapter 55, starting with verse 1. So this is the uh, reading which we often uh, do in, in uh, class. But it was one verse which I didn't uh, quite understand until this uh, series on the kings in uh, Ithaca class. 55 and 1. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Thank you. That's what I didn't quite understand. The sure mercies of David. So we read in Isaiah, uh, it's a prophecy that uh, here and uh, your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. And as I said, I didn't appreciate or understand what this uh, mercies of David is uh, until you know this uh, series on the kings. So as we uh, read during you know the several lectures on the kings, uh, comparing Saul and David. So we uh, read, and uh, I want to go back and uh, read several verses. Uh, we read about. Uh, Samuel, that, uh, you know, when the Holy Spirit was taken out from him, as uh, Carl uh, was saying, you know, the Samuel was uh, fighting the wars, but he did something which displeased uh, Yahweh. So instead of killing all um, the flocks, all the uh, animals, you know, which uh, is Israelites took from the enemies, he, uh, he saved uh, some. And let's read First Samuel 15, 23. 1 Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and the stubbornness and, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of Yahweh, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Right. So the kingdom was taken from Saul because he, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
went okay. against uh, Yahweh or rebelled mm -hmm. against Yahweh. Now we read about David that David uh, did, you know, he didn't uh, do uh, right things during uh, all his life. He mm -hmm. sinned, for example, he sinned with uh, uh, Bathsheba and uh, he's, uh, he committed adultery and he sent her husband to be killed. So it was like uh, he was commit uh, committing a murderous uh, act mm -hmm. because his, uh, you know, adulterous uh, intentions towards uh, uh, Bathsheba. But in spite of that, you know, breaking of the uh, two commandments, really, from 10 commandments of Yahweh under this old covenant, uh, Yahweh spared uh, David. So let's uh, read first Chronicles 17 verses 12 and 13. 17 and 12. He shall build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son and I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him that was before thee. Right, so it's talking about David and Yahweh saying that he wasn't going to take his mercy away from David as he took it from the one who was before David or talking about Saul. Why did it happen? Because David was a, a man of Yahweh's heart. And uh, Yahweh is looking in the heart uh, of uh, man. So let's go to first uh, Samuel and first read first Samuel 16 and 7. First Samuel 16 and 7. But Yahweh said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or in the height of his stature, because I have refused him for Yahweh seeth not as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but Yahweh looketh on the heart. So Yahweh is looking on the heart and uh, just several uh, pages back, First Samuel 13 and 14. First Samuel 13 and 14. But now thy kingdom shall not continue Yahweh has sought him a man after his own heart. And Yahweh has commanded him to be captain over his people because thou has not kept that which Yahweh commanded thee. Right, it's again, he's talking to Saul and he is saying that the kingdom will be taken from Saul. But he said that he's chosen the man under, after his own uh, behavior. He didn't say that. Not after his own behavior, but after his own heart. Because Saul, when Saul uh, sinned, I don't want to go back because we worked with these things uh, before. But when uh, Saul was confronted uh, by the prophet, you know, Saul tried to justify himself, said, I didn't do anything wrong. So when David was confronted by uh, the prophet, David repented uh, right away and he was sorrowful and... Uh, it was a true repentance, and we can read in many Psalms about how broken-hearted uh, David was. And that's what Yahweh is uh, looking at, and the humble and contrite spirit. Mm -hmm. So because of that, and because as we read in Deuteronomy, that uh, Yahweh already prophesied that there are going to be kings long before the kings were uh, established in Israel, why? Because he wanted to uh, set a type and shadow of him being the king, because Yahweh is the king over his chosen and over the whole world. Really, he had to set the type and shadow in Israel, uh, having kings and Israel. And David was the man of Yahweh's heart and the king of um, Yahweh's heart. And uh, Yahweh has established the everlasting covenant with uh, David, the covenant which we read in uh, Isaiah uh, 55th chapter. Uh, please read 2 Samuel chapter 7, 
verses uh, from 12 to 16. Verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. <clears throat> but my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Thank you. So it's, you know, it's a, it's very significant covenant. It's a it's everlasting covenant, and uh, it's the covenant of mercy. So it's mercy uh, for David because even if uh, you sin, uh, he's saying to David, "I'm not going to take away the kingdom or take away this blessing of the covenant uh, from." Uh, you, but it will, you know, I will pardon you. It will continue forever. And as we read the story about David and Bathsheba, uh, the uh, kingdom wasn't taken from David, but as a punishment, his first uh, son from Bathsheba was, uh, uh, you know, died because mm -hmm. of uh, David's transgression. But the second son, uh, who was uh, Solomon, you know, the kingdom was, you know, going through uh, Solomon. Now, mm -hmm. you may think that uh, the lineage of uh, David would, because of this promise, would continue from king to king to king to king until, until our time. But this promise wasn't the physical promise, because there is nothing everlasting uh, or eternal in the physical. Right. And as we read the uh, history, actually the kingdom was taken from David or from Judah uh, in general in uh, uh, 586 uh, BC when uh, uh, Babylonian empire with uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, conquered uh, Israel and uh, Judah. And uh, Zedekiah was the final ruler of Judah. But this covenant still, it doesn't mean that the promise given to David was broken. The promise was given to David about this everlasting kingdom through the Messiah, through Yahshua, who is uh, in the Bible, we read in many places, uh, is a, a son of David. So let's read what uh, Apostle Paul was uh, writing about it. I need X 13, probably start, uh, probably verses 33 and 34 first. X 13, 33. Yahweh has ful fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he has raised up Yahshua again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And it is concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Right. So here we uh, see the, uh, that Paul uh, repeating what we read in, uh, mm -hmm. in the prophet Isaiah about sure mercies of David. And he links this mercies of David with the resur resurrection of uh, Yahshua, uh, the Messiah, because this uh, kingdom, which was or covenant, which was uh, promised to uh, David was everlasting covenant. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit through David himself prophesied uh, about it. Well, let's read Psalms 16 and 10. Sixteen and ten, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. 
right? So it's a, it's a prophecy about Yahshua the Messiah, who is the uh, Holy One, or the and uh, he is not going to see corruption because he is going to resurrect to establish this everlasting covenant. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, explains that here in Psalms, David was speaking about Yahshua the Messiah. Please read Acts chapter 2, verses 31, 32. Acts 2, 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Yahshua, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. For this Yahshua has Elohim raised up, where uh, we are all witnesses. Right. So he's uh, talking, saying that David was prophesying about the resurrection of Yahshua, the Messiah. Now, let me give like one uh, witness that Yahshua was the seed of David. Second Timothy 2 and 8. And I'm, I'm almost done. Second Timothy 2 and 8. Remember that Yahshua, the Messiah of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Right. So Yahshua is the seed of David. So this prophecy, which was given thousands uh, years, uh, uh, no, hundreds years before uh, Yahshua's, uh, Yahshua's life, you know, his death, burial, resurrection, is being fulfilled in uh, Yahshua, who is the seed of David and who is the everlasting uh, king. And what we, uh, Paul, uh, taught that anyone who trusted the gospel of grace could be uh, put into the body of Yahshua and receive the benefits of eternal life that existed in the resurrected seed of David. For example, let's read Acts 13 verses 38 and 39. X thirteen thirty okay, thirteen thirty eight. But uh, let's see. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of. In the prophets, behold, these despisers and wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you shall not in no wise believe, though a man declared unto you. Thank you. So, you know, through uh, Yahshua's uh, resurrection, you know, we are forgiven of our sins. You remember, you, you know, the prophecy in Samuel that it will be everlasting covenant and those who are, uh, you know, and even if uh, David uh, sins, you know, it will be, the Yahweh is going to be merciful. So, and Yahweh has been merciful to us because Yahshua has adopted us and we becoming the sons of uh, uh, Yahshua. And now, as we said already uh, during this class, we are uh, king, he made us the kings and priests, mm -hmm. as we can read in uh, Revelation 1, 5 and uh, 6. And this everlasting covenant is the part of uh, this po promise is given to us. It's going back to Isaiah. Here and your soul shall live because we'll be a part of Yahshua's body and uh, you know, the mercy, the sure mercies of uh, David will be uh, bestowed upon us and are bestowed upon us. So that's you know, the short testimony I wanted to share. Uh, thank you for your attention and praise be to Yahshua.
Tim, are you yeah, there? Yeah. Tim, you're muted. The floor is still open for testimonies. Anybody would like to volunteer? Would... There you go. This Pam. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Dr. Rachmanovich. I don't think that came through. Um, I wanted to thank you for that, and wondered if there was anybody else interested. And if not, I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Greg Prestis. Good afternoon, class. Good afternoon. <laughs> There's an aspect of this that um, hit me a, a long time ago. And I'm sitting here debating whether to try to share it or not. So I guess that decision was made for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I do appreciate it. Um, I'm going to keep this as brief as, as simple as possible. Uh, but it's just an aspect of things that I don't, um, we haven't really brought out yet, although uh, we've touched on it um, in many ways. And I definitely appreciate, I mean, I think the mystery of righteousness and how it's reflected in the kings um, and Solomon's temple and the dedication and David's heart. And um, I think all that has been well represented. Um, and, you know, it is by mercy uh, that any of us um, are able to understand these things in such a way that it has an effect on us and um, allows us to exist or to enter into the kingdom of heaven, which Paul characterizes as righteousness, peace, and joy. And um, I appreciated also um, the aspect that been brought out as far as, you know, we may have a tendency to look down on Saul and, and uh, to judge Solomon in his later years. Um, but when we understand that everything happens by grace and mercy, and that all of us and are created and uh, manifesting Yahweh's purpose as, as we, we in fact we're not separate from Yahweh we are um, multiple aspects of his purpose manifesting and so we see that with Saul being chosen now Saul was a man that appealed he was big and strong and he appealed to um, the worldly aspect of things. And so what I have in mind to share, and I hope you just bear with me and consider these things, and I don't want to go into excruciating detail, but we know it's over there in Ezekiel, and it used to be called all the time, I don't remember offhand, but Yahweh overturns and overturns and overturns. And then if we take a look at this chart, uh, and and I, I just want to do this very briefly, but I do want to just set the stage. Um, we talk about Yahweh being pure spirit and being incomprehensible and inscrutable, that state. So his manifestation as Elohim, which is a visionary experience uh, th that the prophets had, and Moses and certain select individuals, was how Yahweh made himself manifest to mankind. And then we go all the way over to the creation of Adam. And we find that Yahweh formed Adam of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. That's a resurrection, death, burial, resurrection. And then he's placed in the garden 
which is a principle of an ascension or a glorification. And he's given dominion over the creation, he and his wife. So in a very real sense, before the transgression, Adam and Eve are the king and queen of the earth, not to mention that they're the only human beings. And Yahweh has them set. And you can see in Dr. Kinley's chart that um, see Yahshua and his bride. So the end being declared from the beginning, and we have Adam and his bride reigning in the creation at the beginning. So it's what, and it's been worked with how we are uh, one body, the body of Yahshua. We are his bride or um, in the earth plane. Mm -hmm. Now, um, they didn't stay there. The, the mystery of iniquity entered in and caused uh, Eve to be deceived. He deceived Eve, and then they came down. And so Adam is formed of the earth. Eve is taken out of Adam when he's laying on the earth. And then here they come out of the garden, and they come back down to the earth. And Yahweh said, um, you will return to the grave, for dust thou art, and dust thou shalt become, or something like that, because out of the ground thou wast taken, and to the ground that they returned. And to this day, when people die, we bury them. And that is, in principle, returning them to the origin. Now, um, it's important to bear in mind just this cycle, and this is why I'm taking the time to review it, although we all know these things. Now, um, when they come down into the earth and have children, they have Cain and Abel. And in the operation of Cain and Abel, we see the beginnings of the operation of the mystery of iniquity in the earth plane. And there's not a lot written about it, but um, Yahweh has given us Vatican City as an example. And so we find that the mystery of iniquity sets itself up, sets himself up as king and ruler over the earth plane. And to this day, there's the doctrine of the, the Roman Catholic Pope being the rightful ruler of the world. So we see um, a kingdom set up here in iniquity. And then we know that um, because of the operation of the mystery of iniquity down through this age, it gets to the point where Noah finds grace in Yahweh's eyesight. He and his family and the select uh, members of the creation are delivered up out of the creation, and the mystery of iniquity, the, the manifestation of the mystery of iniquity in the earth, in the bodies, Cain and his kingdom um, is destroyed, and the earth is cleansed, and Yahweh makes a covenant with Noah, and we have that rainbow, and Yahweh makes a promise not to destroy. So can you see, we came down, iniquity waxed worse and worse, and then through uh, the operation of Yahweh with Noah, the earth is cleansed by the waters or the flood, and the earth is restored to a state um, uh, where it's free from, from the evil, uh, free from evil manifest, while yet and still water doesn't drown that demonic spirit. And so we understand that through these ages and dispensations of time, the mystery of iniquity came through this mm -hmm. flood. And then that's evident with you have the Tower of Babel, and then all of a sudden, what do they want to do? They want to build a tower. They want to establish another universal kingdom. And they, they uh, in the building of the tower is represented the fact that they don't trust Yahweh's promise. And then the Yahweh confuses their tongues, they're dispersed, they're scattered across the earth, and you have the beginning of the different human governments that we see still in operation today, and you have confusion. Um, now, out of that, Yahweh calls Abraham and reaffirms his promise and makes his promise to Abraham's seed. So in that, and then Abraham physically, he's called from the Ur of Chaldee, and eventually he's up in Canaan's land. Melchizedek is the king and priest of Salem. And I believe Melchizedek, the word means righteousness, and Salem means peace. Plus, Salem 
is the the precursor to the city of Jerusalem. So you have again, and it's already been brought out how Melchizedek being king and priest, and Paul likens this unto the eternal priesthood and the spiritual kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah. So you have uh, Abraham called up into that. So you have um, a, a restoration or a manifestation of the kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. Then to make a long story short, um, Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, Jacob has 12 sons, they betray Joseph, and they all wind up in bondage here in Egypt where they multiply. And then we're very familiar with how they're delivered out of Egypt, they're brought up into Canaan's land, and then this is what we've been reading about, is the establishment of the kingdom of Israel. Now, so uh, when Moses passed away, Moses was their ruler, so to speak, in the wilderness, although he was only doing what Yahweh uh, Elohim was telling him to do. And then that authority passed visibly to Joshua, and it's Joshua, whose name was Yahshua, who brought them over into Canaan's land. And Joshua ruled Israel for 40 years. And then we've talked briefly about how that rule uh, that extended to the judges. And in a sense, Yahshua was the first judge because he didn't sit on a throne and he didn't accumulate riches and he didn't bring glory to himself. Um, he just ruled according to the will of Yahweh, if I can say it that way. Then the judge in the judges, you had judges under which Israel was obedient and you had disobedient judges under which Israel was disobedient. And they go into, they suffer wars and setbacks and captivities, even while they're in the judges. And so this is that purpose of Yahweh, constantly cycling, because these are the types and the shadows. And whenever you get up into the most holy place and you have um, a period of peace, let's say, or a, a manifestation of righteousness, then the purpose continues, time continues, and you have to come down. So now Israel only existed as a united kingdom for the 120 years that we've been discussing. Now, the principle I want to focus on goes all the way back to Samuel 8 and 7, uh, I think through 11. And we had it read in Deuteronomy, and I just don't have time <clears throat> uh, because I do want to sort of just wrap this up and keep it simple but get get through it but we read in samuel i mean in deuteronomy that the king was not supposed to multiply riches and multiply horses and multiply wives and all of those things are uh the things that wealthy powerful people do in the world because they, they gather to them um riches and treasures and we go all the way back to that city of cain and in likening it to the Vatican City and what is Vatican City, look at the treasure and the property and everything. So you have this principle of an earthly kingship being manifest in terms of wealth and power. Now, um, go ahead and read this. The first Samuel 8, 7, right? Yes, please. And Yahweh said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee but they have rejected me. See, it wasn't Samuel who was ruling Israel. It wasn't Moses who was ruling Israel. It wasn't Joshua. It wasn't the judges. It was Yahweh ruling Israel. And as it's been brought out, um, the kingdom that we're in does not have a physical ruler. We're ruled by the spirit of Yahshua. We're ruled by the spirit of truth. Yahshua is our king and high priest. And he rules us from within. He rules us by being resident in our heart, which is the fulfillment of the promise of the new covenant that's come down all the way through. So, in and, and Yahweh had said back in Deuteronomy, when you go into the land and when you decide you want to have a king like all the other kings, um, read on. So they have not rejected you, Samuel, yeah. they've rejected me. So me. Israel, the, the prelude to Saul becoming king is that Israel 
uh, wanting a figurehead, wanting a man on the ground, wanting some person to exalt and look at and say that they were great, just like all the other nations had, which takes you all the way back to that treasure city that Cain set up and um, exalting himself of everyone. Now, go ahead. Verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they unto so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of Yahweh unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself and for his chariots to be his horsemen and shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands, captains over fifties, and will set them to, to, ear, set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them unto his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your sheep, and you shall be his servants. Okay, we've got to move on. But you, you get the idea. Um, when you're choosing this king, you're basically putting yourself into bondage. When you exalt a man to be the ultimate authority in this earth plane, you're essentially becoming um, a bond servant. Now, that also has the spiritual principle, because we are the servants of Yahshua. We are the servants of the truth. But in the cycle of things, this was all manifested with Solomon. He had 700 concubines and 300 wives. That's a multiplication. He multiplied horses. In one year, he received 600, uh, 666 talents of gold. And then we'd already read um, at the end of Solomon's reign how his wives turned his heart away and he worshipped idols. And then Yahweh rent the kingdom. So the kingdom of Israel lasted for 120 years uh, as a united kingdom. And only those, uh, it only lasted that long. Uh, and we had that read because Yahweh um, maintained Solomon's reign uh, during his lifetime for the sake of his servant, David. And then we've discussed how David's heart was perfect with Yahweh. Now, um, what happens when Solomon dies, and um, we've read a little about this, and this is just what I want to pick up on, is um, get for me, please, 1 Kings 12 uh, and 24, and I'm going to set the stage because we just don't have time to read through. But this is where, uh, and we've had some of this read in, in um, before, I believe, where uh, Israel comes, to, Rehoboam is Solomon's son, and he's supposed to be king. And Israel had, sub, remember we read those attributes of the king, he's going to put you in bondage and take of your mm -hmm. goods and take of your children. Mm -hmm. And Solomon's hand was very heavy. So um, the children of Israel wanted relief and told Rehoboam, if you be more reasonable and ease this bondage that we're in and ease the taxes, then um, then we'll serve you. But you read that it was Yahweh's purpose to rend the kingdom. And so the 10 tribes of, became the kingdom of Israel. And then Judah and Benjamin become um, stay in Jerusalem. And they didn't last very long until, un, until Rehoboam disobeyed Yahweh. So remember, these are all types and shadows. And it's not Saul was an evil man and so on and so forth. It's Yahweh operating his purpose. Now, um, 1 Kings 12, 24. So Jeroboam, um, Israel goes off. Jer Jeroboam takes Israel and becomes, the, they make him king. And Rehoboam wants to, he assembles, and he wants to go fight them and recapture the kingdom. Uh, read 24. 
Thus right. saith Yahweh, you shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearken therefore to the word of Yahweh and return to depart according to the word of Yahweh. Keep going. There's a couple and Jer of things. And Jeroboam built Shechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. Now, do you understand what's happening here is Yahweh made Jeroboam king over the ten tribes. But Jeroboam is not a man after Yahweh's heart, and he's not going to be obedient. Now, he's afraid that Israel, when they go to Jerusalem for the yearly uh, trip to sacrifice, he's afraid he'll lose control of them. So, Five minutes, uh, Dr. Yes, Preston. I'm aware. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their master, even unto Rehoboth, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. It is too much to go worship at the temple. We're going to have these golden calves. You just worship these idols. Um, now we have to skip. Um, this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before one, even unto Dan. Read verse 31. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. The Jeroboam ordained a feast. Now, do, you, do you understand? And we're going to, uh, we don't have time to get this probably, but if you read Second Chronicles, the 11th chapter, you'll find that once these kingdoms are split, that Jeroboam persecutes the Levites, and they all return to Jerusalem. And then it also says that everyone who set their heart to worship Yahweh returned unto Jerusalem. So um, in a nutshell, and I'm sure you can see these parallels, but you have someone, Solomon, who was set up as a rightful authority uh, on the throne of David, his father. And in his early years, he manifested wisdom, and he manifested essentially obedience to Yahweh. And uh, after the dedication of the temple, which completed that 490-year cycle, he committed idolatry. And because of that, Yahweh split the tribes. And um, it, you also uh, get the idea in some places that when the leader committed idolatry, then the people, many of the people followed suit. So this comes down to where the kingdom is split, and you have uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, who's still reigning in Jerusalem, which represents those still worshiping the truth or worshiping Yahweh, because remember, in the spiritual kingdom, it's Yahweh is the king, it's not a man. Now, then um, you have Jeroboam, and he goes off and essentially sets up his own religion, sets up his own priesthood, and um, he sets up his own um, holy days. Now, um, go ahead, get get Second Chronicles. Oh, no, I don't, I'm sorry. I, I really don't have the time. So uh, you will read there, Second Chronicles 11, 13, and 16, that Levi returns, and all those who have set their heart return. So you see, we in the kingdom of heaven... We've been taught this gospel, and it's been line upon line, precept upon precept, the way Dr. Kinley delivered it to us. But he told us not to believe him just because he said so, but to prove it. And by proving it, it becomes the reality in our heart. So the king we serve is not a man, and the authority we're conscious of is not the authority of the man. It's the authority of the Holy Spirit or the authority of the truth. And yet... Um, we have the kingdom split between those that continue to worship Yahweh or worship the truth and those that um, worship uh, idolatry. And you have the formulation of a whole new religion with a whole new set of beliefs with these golden calves and the feast days. And somewhere it says in here that uh, Jeroboam set up these feasts out of the imagination of his own heart and set up this worship 
to keep the people occupied, to keep them from returning. So just as this class for a long time was a unified entity in the world, and Dr. Kinley did battle with all the worldly religions, um, we're at a point now where there are those that have kept to um, the true principles or the true gospel, worshiping the true king, which is a spiritual king in um, the kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy, which has been adequately explained through this series. And then we have this formulation that Yahweh has used to separate those with the true heart or with the love of the truth from those who are caught in the trappings and the authority of a physical man. And remember all the way back when Israel chose to worship a man, to exalt a man as their king, Yahweh said, don't worry about it, Samuel. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Um, I hope that made some sense. I'm out of time. So back to you, Pam. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Prestis, and thank everyone who's come today to participate and be a member of our class. And um, we're here every Sunday from 11 until 1. And um, welcome back anytime. <laughs> So um, we are all going to um, say the doxology now. And then I'm, I'm sure Dr. White would want to make an announcement. So now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, be long glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say in unity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, before we all get going, uh, I have I have to apologize. I have to be someplace right away, so I'm not going to be here, uh, but for a brief second. And that is, we're going to have Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter for the scripture lesson next week. If there are any more testimonies, we'll open up the first half of class for, for testimonies, and then we'll continue on to have regular classes and go according to Yahweh's purpose. So uh, mm -hmm. dynamite, dynamite testimonies. So I have to go, and I do apologize, and uh, thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now I have to go to the pharmacy before. Oh.